We are set for the biggest weekly loss on the S&P 500 on the year so far. On the Nasdaq, we are set for the first weekly loss of the year so far. Equity futures right now down a half of 1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, looking ahead to next week's inflation print, crude climbing as Russia gets set to cut output and Japan closing in on its next central bank chief. We begin with the big issue, CPI in America. We have CPI looming next week. We have a big CPI report coming up next week. That CPI print is kind of a sneaky risk event. Jeff Powell essentially selling us their data dependent. He basically said, all right, you guys want to play data dependent, we'll play data dependent. Investors have largely assumed away inflation risk. A good CPI report. Um, which, again, will just increase this sort of pain trade, increase this sort of turn up in, in the fundamentals. If you were to get a little bit of a surprising print there. We could get uh, some more bumpy inflation news. It's the kind of thing that could, could A, disrupt the rally, and B, I think embolden people to kind of lean against the rally we've seen. It's not clean sailing for the markets. CPI is going to be interesting. Valentine's Day is all that matters. CPI. Tuesday morning. Joining us now, Pick Tace, Ella Hodger, Morgan Stanley's Matt Horn back to both of you. Thanks for being with us. Ella, first to you. CPI, your words next week Valentine's <laughs> gift or massacre? Which one is it? Well, we'd say probably the odds are skewed to a slightly softer print. And that's, you know, all of the stuff we've been talking about for the last three, four months base effects, supply constraints easing off. So it's just sheer uh, mathematics. Um, so, you know, there is a risk that it comes on the on the softer side, which I guess for markets is the gift uh, of Valentine's. But, uh, of course, for a portfolio manager, you always worry, particularly in, on the bond side, uh, for how things can go wrong. And, and certainly, given the rally we've had across the board uh, over the last three months, and particularly here today, uh, there is, of course, a skew that if the number does come on the higher side, we can have a bit of a nasty reaction similar to what we got after the non-farm payrolls data last Friday. So we're certainly tilting portfolios to, to be sensitive to that risk. Well, especially after the payrolls report this time last week. Matt, with that in mind, what's in store on Tuesday? Well, John, our economists, uh, who are led by Ellen Zentner, uh, our chief U.S. economist, it, they're looking for um, a, a 0.4 out of the core CPI uh, number. And that's uh, in line with consensus, John. I think it's notable, though, that in the wake of the labor market report last week, we did see economists uh, begin to revise higher their expectations for CPI. And we also know, and it's now a well-known factoid, that January CPI has surprised uh, in nine of the past 10 years to the upside. So, you know, investors, I do think, are concerned that uh, this number could be a spicy one uh, on Valentine's Day. Pushing that data through the bond market. I'll leave that one there, Matt. <laughs> we'll explore that at another time. <laughs> Your two-year yield this time last week, 4.09 percent. We're 40 basis points higher than we were last week. Ella, I know that for you, you think there's still some risk at the front end. How much risk? How much risk is there, upside risk, to higher DM terminal rates? John, I... I well, if you... <laughs> that was for you, Ella. Take it away. Yes, uh, of course. Thanks, John. Um, OK, so because of the risks that we faced from the NFP data and because of this tilt that we were saying that markets are much more sensitive to a higher print, uh, that makes the front end especially vulnerable. And that's exactly why you've had the reaction that you've had since since last week in, in the two year part of the curve. If you model three different economic scenarios, i.e. the sort of, uh, you know, the Goldilocks that we've been playing so far or this scenario where growth is a lot uh, better, but that means you have to price in a tighter Fed, or this other scenario, which is the calamity one, which the markets were uh, freaking out about last year. Uh, you know, if of those three scenarios, there's only one where the front end is a bit more supported. So if you probabilistically weighed it, uh, you certainly would have more skew for upside in the front end. And this is kind of like what makes us stay away from that. So that still on the three scenarios makes the long end of the curve more attractive, uh, certainly over the course of this year. Uh, so we like to have a tilt to that. So we still like U.S. rates. But we're cautious of the front end. So, Matt, you've got the two-year, I think, at 325, the 10-year at three. Are they still the cause for this year? 
John, those those are still the calls. Our economists don't think that the January number disrupted the overall trend in payrolls, which is to weaker numbers as we make our way through 2023. And, and that makes sense, uh, I, I think. So uh, as the labor market continues to slow, I mean, bear in mind, John, that uh, the Fed doesn't think we've really seen a peak tightness come through and hit the economy. That makes perfect sense in light of these backward revisions to 2022. It, it doesn't really look like the tightening in monetary policy last year uh, really began to impact the broader economy. So 2023 is when that should happen, John. That's what we're expecting. We'll see. I mean, that's the call from Matt. And who am I to say it's wrong? At this point, we're seeing stronger data. No landing is a theme I keep hearing about from a lot of people. Really, this conversation started with Neil Dutter of Renaissance Macro coming into 2023. Torsten Slock of Apollo jumping on board. He said no landing in an email to me this morning. That's his base case now. He went on to say inflation will be sticky. The Fed has more work to do and more demand destruction is needed. Ella, what do you make of that, this no landing theme? I mean, certainly we've had corroboration of that theme so far. Um, if I may recall back in 2006, 2007, you know, a very sort of important pinnacle for markets uh, back then, uh, it was a similar scenario. We started to get some um, data that showed that things weren't uh, as bad as we thought after the Fed having tightened so much. And of course, we know what happened later down the road. So it's not clear to us. I mean, this is a very difficult macro environment to navigate. You can tilt from one pendulum swing to the other. And so you have to navigate very carefully. Now, so far, the data seems OK, but you, you do have to take a a bit of a broader time frame and a historical time frame on this. When we have this level of tightening in the market, eventually it does end up slowing down the economy, right? And we've had quite uh, the fastest pace of hiking, uh, hiking uh, from the Fed, as well as tightening of liquidity. So down the road, uh, most bond managers will tell you this does lead to a uh, more of a recessionary outcome. I keep returning to that line from Julian Emanuel of Evercore earlier this week. If you're not confused, you're not paying attention. Equity futures right now down a half of 1%. Mike McKee's paying attention. I don't know if he's confused. Mike McKee next week's CPI after that blowout payrolls report this time last week. Yeah, I'm coming in to be your little black cloud today. Uh, we have some bad news for you ahead with the CPI numbers because they're not going to be as good as they have been. And this may just add to the whole pressure on the markets to decide what the Fed is going to do. Take a look here. Uh, the bad news is we're expecting the headline CPI to go up by half a percent. It went down a tenth of a percent in December. Core at three tenths unchanged, but still both of those are showing no sequential improvement to the Fed and in the case of the headline, uh, a much worse outcome. So do we get that? There's a good chance of it. And here's why. Uh, the BLS is changing the CPI category weighting starting this month. They used to do it every 10 years, change the weights in the categories, how much each purchase matters to people. Uh, now they're moving it to, two, well, they moved it to two years. Now they're moving it to uh, one year, which will be good in the long run because it'll give us a quicker look at what people are actually paying for. But according to Omar Sharif of Inflation Insights, he says it could boost the core this month by two to three basis points, which would not be seen as good news in a maybe non-discriminating market that doesn't look as closely. We know gasoline prices rose in January, used car prices rose in January. So there is an upside risk to CPI. And then the question is, what does the Fed do about it and how does the market react to that? Well, the Fed has kind of preemptively told us. Jay Powell on Tuesday said, we are going to need to do further rate increases. And then everybody else on the Fed who spoke this week, we can summarize their remarks by saying, yeah, what he said. They're all saying we're going to raise rates some more and we're going to leave them high. Does that mean you need to push up uh, your bets on the two year, push down the 10 year, steepen that curve even more? Uh, you guys are going to have to decide that out there. But uh, that seems to be the trade at the moment. Mike, you're awesome. Phenomenal, as always. And to Mike's point, it looks like the path is set for the next couple of meetings for this Federal Reserve is what happens after that. We caught up with a guest this morning from Bloomberg Surveillance who said the disinflationary process may well look like it started, but once you get to the summer, you might have a bit of a problem. We'll have a debate about it maybe being stickier. David Leibovitz of JP Morgan yesterday morning said to us on the same program, he said he thinks disinflation is going to go back on the shelf with transitory. Now, I just wonder, Matt Hornback, what the pushback is against that later this year. Well, John, the, the pushback is pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Despite what now appears to be a much stronger labor market in 2022, 
We still had sequential declines in wage inflation starting from the first quarter of 2022. If you look at the ECI and the quarterly numbers that have come out and you annualize them, they've been declining since the first quarter of last year. We had a peak in headline and core measures of inflation in the fourth quarter, in the, in the third quarter of last year, John. That's despite what now appears to be a much stronger labor market. If these you know, forecasters believe that the economy is going to produce 300,000 jobs a month for the next 12 months, fine, we can talk about inflation reaccelerating. But, John, that's not likely to happen. Inflation is likely to continue to slow. Alarian had this to say in Project Syndicate this week. As inflation gradually eases, the claim that today's inflationary pressures are the result of a temporary supply shock has reemerged. It could also encourage dangerous complacency, making an already serious problem much harder to solve. Ella, do you think the word transitory is coming back maybe a little too prematurely? <laughs> Well, we may find some of those supply issues that we were talking about last year uh, turn out to be transitory, but like that transitory period is more like 18 months as opposed to what the Fed was expecting. I don't know, John. You know, I don't have the magical answer. Um, all we know is basically that maybe just that's not the thing to focus on right now. Maybe the thing to focus on is exactly wages and the tight labor market because famous last words but there is something different about the labor market now and that is basically that it's a tight labor market there was a good chunk of the uh, employment base that left during the pandemic and has not returned and so that's what's making the the job of the fed very very tricky so this wages number are numbers are important and they might take some time to come down so that's what worries bond markets with this uh, analogy of higher for longer, which is certainly a new theme for bond markets. Well, let's pick up on that, that labour market story, Matt. I just want to finish on that with you. What's your degree of confidence, your level of confidence around the labour market story, just the post-pandemic realities of this labour market in America? I, I mean, John, I think the, the confidence comes from the idea that it's going to be very difficult for the economy to produce the same number of jobs with much tighter monetary policy coming through over the course of the year. Uh, the, the idea that policy operates with lags, I think, is a very reasonable one. And the idea that the tightening the Fed put into place last year didn't quite have much of an impact on the economy last year is also very reasonable. So the idea that we're going to be producing 300,000 jobs a month, uh, despite 5% plus interest rates in the U.S., just baffles me. I don't see how that's possible. That's the debate right now, at least. Matt Hornback, thank you, sir. Alongside Ella Hodger, they'll be sticking with us. Looking at the rally in crude this morning, it faced just a little bit. We're up nine tenths of 1% on WTI, on Brent up more than 1%. Coming up, Russia cutting its output. A million barrels per day more from China, a million barrels per day less from the SBR. That's a swing of two million barrels per day. I think the market's too focused on Russia. The other two alone can take us to $100. Well, that focus is back on Russia. 500,000 barrels a day set to be cut from next month. And we understand OPEC Plus is not ready to step in. That conversation up next. Oil prices, we know they are critical to the formation of inflation expectations among households and central banks have been very focused on that. Russia with this cut, the reply by OPEC, more demand from China, especially as mobility increase. This could complicate matters and in a market that's already priced that inflation will be back down almost to central bank target by the end of this year, uh, could prove wrong. Russia pushing back against international sanctions, announcing plans to cut oil production by 500,000 barrels a day. The Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak saying the following. The mechanism of price caps on Russian crude and petroleum products is an intervention in market relations and an extension of destructive energy policies of the collective West. This is OPEC Plus signals it's not filling the gap, briefly pushing prices close to $87 a barrel on Brent. The team coverage with two of the best starts right now with Paul Wallace out of Dubai and Will Kennedy in London. Paul, talk to me, just frame this one, what we've heard from Russia and what you're hearing from OPEC+. Plus. Hi, John. So there was a bit of a jump in oil prices um, earlier today when Russia made this announcement that it's going to cut uh, crude production by half a million barrels a day from uh, next month. Um, oil went up to almost $87 a barrel, about um, almost 3% higher. This was flagged by Novak, Alexander Novak, Russia's um, uh, sort of oil chief, 
uh, late last year, in December, he actually said that Russia was looking at 500,000 to 700,000 uh, barrels a day of cuts uh, in early 2023. But of course, there must have been some people in the market that didn't expect that to um, happen. And now it has. Oil has paired some of its gains, though. So I think some people um, have um, dialed back um, those bets on how much sort of uh, turmoil this is going to uh, cause in the oil market. And Paul, with that in mind, what's the logic behind OPEC Plus and a couple of delegates telling Bloomberg maybe that they're not going to fill the gap? What's the logic behind that? This is has this has been their thinking for for at least some weeks now that they see the oil market as being balanced and um, it's increasingly clear that they don't want to raise production until at least 2024. Many people in the market who had expect them to start raising output earlier than that, probably around June or or, or July or or August. I think for the moment they're going to stay put. Uh, at least that's what we're we're hearing, and the reason is. They, they're saying they need to see evidence of a market uh, being out of, uh, um, um, out of balance uh, before they move on anything. Um, so far, you know, today's announcement isn't enough in and of itself to cause that. Uh, I guess we'll see in the coming weeks if, um, if it is enough to, to Some cause people serious, might uh, be surprised by the potential for consequences of this decision, Will Kennedy, because I think some people don't quite realise how much Russian crude is still on the market, still being consumed every single day. How significant is this? Well, you're exactly right. Russia had been producing uh, almost 11 million barrels a day. Production had fell in the immediate aftermath of the invasion and recovered steadily. And uh, that puts it well ahead of uh, um, Saudi Arabia in recent months, for example. Uh, so that had been one of the reasons why oil had stayed fairly subdued over the last uh, few weeks. But I think it really can make a difference, and especially when you look at the factors that you had Henri Tassem describing earlier, which is increased Chinese demand uh, as the economy uh, reopens and less oil out of the US SPR. And you put that together with the other theme that's been on your program of an economy that's stronger than many people expected and not slowing down. And as Amrita said, it can become a pretty bullish brew quite quickly. We've got that right now, at least this week, up about 8%, I think, on the week so far. Will Kennedy, Paul Wallace, two of the very best from our team on commodities, breaking it down for you. The potential for 500,000 barrels a day to be cut from output out of Russia and the uh, lack of potential for OPEC Plus to step up and offset this. Bullish crude seems to be the view from UBS right now. Lower Russian crude production together with China's reopening should tighten the oil market further over the coming quarters. The team goes on to say we advise risk-taking investors to add long exposure. Crude right now, WTI 78, Brent 85. Back with us, Matt Hornback, Ella Hodger. Ella, I thought we'd be focused on the demand side in crude with China reopening. This morning we're focused on the supply side. But let's touch on demand. China reopening. How are you thinking about that theme going through the rest of this year? It's a very important theme for markets because a lot of this delta on global growth over the past, we can say, 10 years or so has been coming from China. And so uh, the reopening um, is a different one, uh, at least for us, in terms of how it plays out this time around. Uh, it's far more consumption-led, therefore far more domestic in nature. It will leak outside, and it tends to leak through travel and tourism and those that will export into this Chinese consumer. But the delta, uh, we believe, is, is likely to be lower. And so with markets having played out this China reopening thing for the last three, three months, there are risks that we get disappointment. And so I know that's not what a lot of people want to hear, but to us, that's what seems likely. So that's on the demand side. More broadly, uh, for commodities, uh, the supply side will matter, uh, you know, once we get some more clarity on this short-term tactical uh, demand aspect. More broadly down the line, commodities are supported. So for, for a lot of the global money managers, it is certainly an asset class that they want to have exposure to. And in terms of currencies, particularly to fixed income, uh, commodity currencies over the medium to long term do offer some value and protection to portfolios. And to your point on the potential for disappointment, looking out to 23, Consensus forecast for China GDP is 5.1 percent the year after 5 percent. Milken's Bill Lee said the same thing this morning. He thinks that maybe you get a downside surprise on GDP. And Matt Hornback, he also suggested the potential for leakage, spillover, positive spillover from a better growth story. He doesn't think it's that great. Where are you on that? Well, well, John, I mean, I, I think when we look at the growth impulse coming out of China, it clearly helps Asia the most out of any of the regions around the world. 
Uh, next would, would probably be Europe, and then <clears throat> a distant third would be the U.S. So from our perspective, uh, you know, we're not really expecting much of the growth impulse to, to benefit growth here in the United States, John. Matt, where does that leave the dollar call? Cool? So uh, medium term uh, to long term, we still think the dollar has a decent amount of downside. More tactically, of course, uh, in the wake of the payroll revisions and the upcoming CPI report, it becomes a bit trickier. Uh, but certainly medium term, we think if the U.S. growth picture improves further uh, in 2023, unlikely we think, but if it happens, then that's an environment where the dollar can continue to go down, John. You're going to have a growth impulse out of China, good growth in the U.S., and uh, rebounding growth in Europe. That's a recipe for dollar weakness. Ella, are you taking the other side of that? Um, I do, I'm afraid. <laughs> and that's because I think the story that Matt's describing is what's been playing out already. You know, we, we reached very toppish levels of the dollar. Everybody got long because we were all scared of the big bad recession. And now that's sort of taken, you know, the Dixie index that you're flagging here, uh, you know, at least 50 percent lower thus far. And so to us, a lot of those positions have been cleaned out. Yet we have a tight dollar backdrop, right? So when you look at the central bank liquidity, the dollar is the one that's actually lacking. So uh, compared to the euro and the yen. So for us that, you know, interest rate differential story has played out now, you know, Europe and, and Japan potentially catching on to that. And so that to us means that the dollar plays a really important role in a portfolio in terms of hedging you versus those scary risks we talked about, i.e. either global growth disappoints, yeah. in which case the dollar we think will perform, or the other risk, which is, oh, things are quite hunky-dory in the U.S., and therefore the Fed needs to stay uh, tighter for longer. So we actually have been increasing exposures uh, to our portfolio in dollars. So we had been scaling back those for the last three months, and now we actually like owning some dollars. We think it's in a good spot to go higher. Yeah. Ella, thank you for being with us and for that call on the dollar. Ella Hodger there, Matt Hornback, the two of you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, as always, buddy. Man United, let's bring up the stock quickly. Stock's down about 5% in the pre-market. The latest from ESPN. This according to sources, Man United's potential bidders unsure that the Glazer family wants a full sale. That stock just dropping going into the opening bell. I'll pick up on that a little bit later. Up next, your morning calls and later, Lyft getting absolutely crushed. is fading into the opening bell. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Mizuo upgrading Micron, citing improving structural trends in the memory market. Stiefel upgrading VF Corp, seeing an attractive valuation following recent declines. And finally, City downgrading Lyft to neutral, expecting a competitive environment to continue. That stock getting absolutely hammered. Coming up, we'll pick up on the Lyft story and we'll go to JP Morgan's David Kelly on why he thinks investors should play a growth slowdown. Twenty-four seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning to you. Equity futures lower by a third of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq down three quarters of one percent on the S&P, heading towards the biggest weekly loss of the year so far. On the Nasdaq 100, heading towards the first weekly loss of the year so far. Futures a bit softer. There's your opening bow. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Yields near the highs of the year, just sub 370 on a 10-year. 368.26 yields up two basis points on a two-year through 450. We closed out 2022 at 442 and right now 447 but this morning through 450 going into CPI on Tuesday in the FX market euro dollar negative four tenths of one percent back to 106 107 right now at 106 98 and that crude rally it fades just a little bit been pretty powerful through the week still up by seven to eight percent or so on WTI just short of 80 78 dollars and about 90 cents at one percent on the session. About 30 seconds into this session, we're down two tenths of 1% on the SP. On the NASDAQ, we're down five or six tenths of 1%. One stock to watch in the open, check out Lyft. Flirting with its biggest one day decline on record after issuing disappointing guidance, the CEO Logan Green saying the following The company is reviewing adjustments to the business, including cost cutting measures. Mandeep Singh, we're down 31%. And Mandeep, I have to say, you flagged it a little bit earlier this week. Yeah, and look, I, I think the fact that CEO is talking about cost cutting when your competitor is growing north of 35%, it's not a good sign that they're focused on, you know, cash burn right now. 
And Uber specifically talked about their incremental margins being 12%. In the case of Lyft, they're negative. So what it tells you is even though they grew in the quarter, they had all sorts of problems on the cost side, whether it was insurance or just adding driver supply, and that's not a good, healthy marketplace. So clearly, scale is an issue for Lyft, and right now they are too focused on cost cutting when your uh, competitor is taking market share. Mandeep, why are their fates so different right now? What does Uber have that Lyft doesn't? So Lyft has more of a West Coast exposure, and they talked about, you know, West Coast being slow to come back in terms of reopenings and just the volume of rides. I do think they didn't focus as much on the supply aspect that Uber got it right, and Uber was somewhat helped by bundling delivery. So right now, think of, you know, how many subscriptions a cons customer can have. It can have an Uber subscription, DoorDash, Lyft. You can't have all of those. And what Uber did was they bundled everything. And if you had to pick one, chances are consumers are going to go with an Uber subscription as opposed to the others that are offering. And that is where scale matters. I think that's the only mode in this business is scale. Mandeep, is it too early to say there will only be one winner here in the U.S. and there just isn't space for two? I mean, it was a duopoly, but the duopoly wasn't even. And I do think Uber is gaining at least one to two percentage points of market share every quarter. So right now it was 70-30. I think in the next few quarters it will probably be 80-20 if I had to take a guess, and that wow. will force Lyft to consider strategic options. What are those strategic uh, options? Sale. Well, talk to me about it. Who would be the buyer? Well, it could be any of the large tech companies that is trying to play the autonomous theme. So Lyft still has a network where you could deploy those cars. And I think that's where it gets interesting because you need the data in terms of, uh, you know, how uh, the routes are, what sort of demand there is. And to my mind, whether it's level three, four or five, if you are trying to play the theme of autonomous as a car maker, you have to think about how to deploy it, and uh, the ride-sharing companies are perfect for that. So Lyft still has a network that is valuable for any car company trying to deploy autonomous driving. What a move, Mandeep. Great work this week. Appreciate it, sir. As always, Mandeep Singh there of Bloomberg Intelligence. Look at the name, Lyft, getting hammered down 33%. Close here, biggest one-day decline ever. Frame it this way, though. Close the year 2022 at 11. Right now, 10.84. We'd rallied by more than 40% year-to-date. We've wiped it all out, just like that, in three or four minutes. Brutal stuff for that stock. Bit of a mixed picture for PayPal. Let's pick up on that company. The company reporting better than expected guidance on the back of a slow growth quarter. Ed on the West Coast with more. Hey, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Happy Friday. The market, as you say, is kind of weighing both negatives and positives. The negatives are that payments volumes did uh, uh, drop faster than expected in the holiday quarter, slowed down faster than expected. Uh, so the top line picture is murky and they didn't give full year guidance on the top line. But cost cutting seems to be working in the market, at least this Friday, cheering uh, the EPS guidance that this year earnings per share will climb to $4.87, 18% gain. I think the street was looking for something like $4.75 uh, for the full year period. Dan Shulman, longtime CEO, will retire at the end of this year. So that is another factor. This is a stock that a year ago was trading at $120 a share. But the other way of looking at it is its valuation um, relative to major benchmarks, how attractive it is. It's interesting because you can take two inferences from it, right, John? You can say, OK, uh, gross payments on the platform are really slowing down. That's a worrying sign in holiday quarter for the consumer. But there's still growth there, even if it's slowing. It's just we didn't get a firmer guide on the top line. One uh, important development this morning, John, we've had a regulatory filing this morning that has disclosed a probe. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has asked PayPal for information on how it treats customers who have accidentally sent a Venmo payment ah. to someone that they didn't mean to. I don't know if you're a Venmo user. This is something that I've experienced, but kind of a PSA for anyone out there that uses Venmo. The regulators are looking into this. Someone sent me money on accident once. Not a big number, something like $15, $20. And they took it back. They took it back pretty quickly. Now, TK never sends me money, Ed, <laughs> never. Ed, can I finish on this important question? Sure. For you and I both, is it Adidas for you or Adidas? Uh, Adidas. Still Adidas. Um, ad yeah. Do you remember when we were kids and we called Nike Nike in the UK? Nike. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. That doesn't work here at all. Ed, thank you. Brits in the US. Yeah. On the West Coast. Ed Ludlow. Adidas. Should we talk about Adidas? Let's do that right now. The stock under pressure getting hammered in Germany. 
as the company warns of a 700 million euro loss from its fallout with rapper Kanye West. Oli Crook out of Berlin joins us now with more. Hey, Oli. John, it's remarkable the impact that a single partnership can have on a company the size of Adidas. You know, we knew it was going to be bad going into this, but the price action this morning just tells you that we did not know how bad it was going to be. So Adidas was as recently as, uh, you know, before October when they had to dissolve the relationship, calling this the most successful partnership in the industry's history. Um, and, you know, it's saying it's going to cost them 1.2 billion euros in revenue this year. And that's an even bigger problem for profit. These are high margin items, the Yeezy line. According to some analysts, it accounts for about half of Adidas's total profit. Profit. And these relationships really are the magic for companies like Adidas. You know, they have other partnerships like the Ivy Park brand with Beyonce. But the Wall Street Journal overnight saying that uh, sales from that brand fell 50% last year. So even with someone like Beyonce, it's no guarantee. And it's a story being told in the stock today. But it's also a, st a story being told longer term, Nike versus Adidas. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was a $60 billion market cap spread between these two companies. This morning, it's $160 billion. You notice how Ali uses both pronunciations because he came from Brooklyn and went to Berlin. So now he's doing both Adidas and Adidas. Ali, I'm hedged. You're hedged. You're going to pick one? I have to go Adidas. It is correct, I'm of afraid to say. That's the correct way of doing it because you're in Berlin now. Ollie, thank you. Good to catch up, mate. As always, Ollie Crook there out of Berlin on the latest with Adidas. I live here and I just don't care enough to, to, to say Adidas all the time. We need to talk about layoffs too. News Corp, Lionsgate. Canopy growth. Abby, it's just been name after name after name again this week. It really has been. And this is really the theme of this year, layoffs, primarily in tech. But now it is starting to spread out a little bit relative to some of those big tech names, though. We're talking about the biggest of them, Salesforce, Alphabet, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Dell. Microsoft layoffs have already begun, actually, starting just yesterday. In total, uh, 10,000 jobs are to be cut. They're offering very generous severance packages. Now, probably the jobs yesterday having to do with an Army Goggles contract that was reduced. But News Corp and Canopy Growth, to your point, big, big layoffs. Can Canopy uh, is laying off 60% of its workforce or 800 jobs. It has everything to do with the bad quarter. Both of these companies put up bad quarters with EBITDA sliding by 30%, sales sliding. Uh, so this is probably less a matter of the over hiring that we've seen so much for technology and more having to do with fundamental demand. Now that has been a theme for technology too. But interestingly, John, we have this divide where we have all these layoffs in technology, 100,000 jobs cut in the tech sector this year, yet the NASDAQ 100 on the year up about 15 percent. A piece of this may have to do with previous cycles. You have these layoffs and the bad news is seen as good news in terms of the worst is over. But yep. we do have the possibility of some sort of a recession, maybe a rolling recession. And if we start to see these layoffs continue to spread into other sectors, John, it could be a problem. That's the big if. Avi, thank you for that. Thank you very much. That's the disconnect for some of you, at least. One industry, does it spread? And ultimately, when does it start to show up in the overall numbers? Jobless claims just starting to clip higher this week for the first time, I think in about six weeks, but claims still sub 200K. This is the message from David Kelly of JP Morgan. The resilient growth story won't last long. He writes the following. Despite recent strong numbers on GDP and jobs, there is a slowdown lurking which should belatedly cause the Fed to reverse course. It could benefit investors who are willing to position themselves today for an eventful return to a slow growth, low inflation and low interest rate economy. David, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. David, great to catch up, sir, as always. So let's start there. There's a growth slowdown lurking. Not many of us can see it. What do you see? Well, I think both the GDP data and the employment data are very distorted right now. Uh, so first of all, on the GB GDP side, we saw a big run up in inventories in the fourth quarter. Uh, I still think the trend growth rate of the economy right now is running probably less than 1% in the first half of this year. And the problem is that's gonna keep going over, over at least the next two years. We've got uh, you know, a very tight labor market, so we don't have any extra workers to throw at the economy. Productivity growth isn't that strong on a trend basis. So the economy is gonna grow very slowly anyway. And the fourth quarter was something of, a, of an anomaly. And same thing with, with employment. I mean, remember, not seasonally adjusted, employment fell by two and a half million people in January. Now, if you've got a very tight labor market, and this is the one time that you can actually hire somebody who just got laid off, or maybe you hire them. And equally, if you've had a really hard, hard time finding people, maybe you don't lay them off. So I think the fact that January is always so weak in terms of employment kind of distorts these numbers. So I'm suspicious of that. What I see in the economy, though, is a lot of drag, uh, which is going to keep this economy very slow and on the edge of recession if it doesn't fall into a recession for the next two years. David, this quote, slow growth, low inflation, 
low interest rate economy. Is this 2019 again? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, we've been on, a, on a, this huge roller coaster, but the, 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 the interesting thing about roller coasters is you actually get off where you got, got on. And I think that's exactly where we're going to end up. I think we're going to end up back in the middle of the last decade with the uh, inflation rate going down below 2% in 2024. And in the middle of this decade, the Federal Reserve is going to be muttering about how they can get inflation back up to 2%. This economy is not an inflation-prone economy. And if, you, if we just wait for this thing to, to work its way through, I think we'll be back in, in a very slow growth, low inflation environment. So, David, I know a ton of people who take the other side of this who think we have serious regime change on our hands, which means serious leadership change in the equity market. Do you take the other side of that debate as well? Uh, well, I think that the, the change in leadership that we've seen in the last uh, last year is long overdue. I think that there was a, a, an exuberance about markets in a very low interest rate environment, which caused growth to outperform value. And now we've seen that gap close. I think we could see some more closing of that gap in volatile markets, but the, the gap's not as large as it was. Uh, so overall, within the U.S., I think things will be... Um, you know, pretty close between value and growth between small and large. The one obvious discrepancy still is the dollar is way too high. And we saw the dollar fall, and now it's reversed a little bit on these strong economic numbers. But I think that long-term decline will resume um, over the next uh, year or two. So I think that's one part of leadership we still have to see change here because the U.S. is still you know, has beaten international equities for, for so many years. Uh, I think it's a, you know, I think it'll, we do still need to see some reversal in the dollar, decline in the dollar in the long run, uh, and international equities do better relative to U.S. equities. And David, can we get your world without a contraction in consumer spending, which has been supported for so long now? Uh, well, you can't get into a recession, I don't think, without a contraction in consumer spending. But remember, you know, consumer spending is two-thirds of the story. But housing is, definitely, is, is obviously very weak. Uh, you've got ex net exports are going to be weak because of the high dollar and relatively slow overseas growth. Um, and then government spending, certainly from the federal government, is going to be uh, pretty constrained. So I think you can get a slow growth environment, but you're right. If, you, if consumers don't actually go negative, I think you avoid a recession. But there's not a lot powering consumer spending growth going forward. Remember, the saving rate is half what it was a year ago. So people have been racking up credit card debt, trying to maintain a standard of living, which they're not going to be able to maintain. And so I think, that, I think consumer spending growth will be very slow from here, although it may not turn negative. Sounds like you're pretty constructive on the bond market. Michael Hunt at BFA put out a note this morning. He said 60-40, that portfolio, best start to any year since 1991. David, you might appreciate this quote. He said, an English strategist moved back to London with his wife from New York. After three years, someone asked the wife, what's the best thing about living in London? And the wife replied, Paris. That's his quote, not mine. I love London. Went on to say, what's the best thing about stocks in 2023? And he said bonds. Now, David, I just wonder how supportive you think bonds are going to be this year. I think, I think it should be a good year for both stocks and bonds. But, uh, you know, if you're a long-term investor, um, I think you will get better returns out of the stock market longer term. So, you know, I wouldn't... Uh, uh, it is true that, you know, last year was a bad year for bonds after many, many, many um, good years for bonds. And I, I think that, you know, that we saw that, that one year reversal. I think bonds will do well today. I think people uh, this year, I think by the end of the year, people will recognize that the, the Federal Reserve cannot sustain a federal funds rate above 5% for long. They're going to start pricing in uh, cuts to that federal funds rate. And I think that'll help the bond market. But still, in terms, you know, given where we're starting in rates, I think that over the next five years, you'll make more money in stocks. David, I just want to finish with one more question on stocks if I can. And that's on Europe. David, I heard you do a podcast recently with Meb Faber. I thought it was fantastic. And you talked about Europe and you said the one thing that would change investor attitudes is performance. We're getting that performance, David Kelly. Why do you think it continues? Well, I think, well, first of all, I think the European economy is actually, has actually gotten through this, this energy crisis very well. I think the, European, the Eurozone economy is, is doing better, actually, posted Brexit. In, in relative terms than it did before that. So I think Europe has got quite a lot of upside here. But the real issue is, you know, the US is about 60% of global stock market capitalization, but it's also about 60% of global stock market investors. We are the world stock market investors here in the United States. And we've got to feel better about Europe for European stocks to outperform, for global investors to, to, do, to put money into Europe. So I think part of it's about you know, European stocks outperforming for a little while. But a lot of that is also about the dollar. If the dollar comes down, that's going to cause European stocks to outperform for U.S. investors. If that continues for a year or two, then I think a lot of people are going to jump on the bandwagon. David, brilliant to hear from you.
something very self-fulfilling about all of that. David Kelly there of JP Morgan. David, thank you. Equities right now, about 16 minutes into the session, down two tenths of 1%. One story we still haven't discussed this morning. Up next, a new candidate emerging for the BOJ. Ueda San is an academic. He's not political. He's very pragmatic. And he says what he sees. That conversation, up next. Ueda San is an academic, he's not political, he's very pragmatic, and he says what he sees. When you look at the, the Dolly Yen reaction this morning, that to me was a classic example of people pulling materials of comments made by Ueda San over the years. There were hawkish comments, there were dovish comments, and I think there was reactions either way to that. Love how Penny. Maybe a little bit of confirmation bias there, depending on which headlines you want to choose. Japan Iig, a surprise candidate for BOJ governor. Bloomberg reporting, alongside many others, the Prime Minister is set to nominate Kazuo Ueda to leave the central bank. The decision blindsiding investors, expecting the deputy governor to take the helm and sparking a bit of volatility in the Japanese yen. Mike McKee, what do we need to know about this gentleman? Well, you have to start with the fact that... Uh Kuroda-san, Haruhika Kuroda, is leaving the Bank of Japan after 10 years, March 20th, his last day, and he put in place yield curve control and a whole lot else to try to keep uh, interest rates low and push inflation up. Now, uh, as you say, he is leaving, and for a long time, his deputy, Maya Soshi Amomiya, was expected to be the uh, replacement, and he apparently turned the job down. So the reporting from Tokyo is, is that uh, Ueda-san is going to take the position. He's a former Bank of Japan governor, uh, a board member himself. And then the question is, uh, what are his policies going to be, specifically around this one? Yield curve control. The Japanese have been doing yield curve control uh, for years now. Uh, Kuroda put it in place, and basically they will spend anything necessary to keep the yield on the 10-year note in a low range. You can see the yield curve in Japan is kinked because of that. And there's a feeling that now with inflation double what the bank's target is, they could get rid of it. And so everybody is asking, what is Ueda going to do? Uh, now, he has suggested that perhaps they need to think about in the future changing it. Current policy is appropriate and monetary easing needs to be continued at this point, he says. But he suggested a policy review at some point in the future. So there's your both sidesism, John, that you were talking about. As I mentioned, a university professor, BOJ board member. Uh, he has a PhD from MIT, very well connected to the BOJ. So he is not expected to rock the boat. And uh, as Derek Halpany said, he is considered something of a centrist with Without a very strong viewpoint on uh, what should be done. We should also mention that uh, Sinichi Uchida and Ryoso Himino were expected to be his deputies. Both of them have supported yield curve control and have worked closely with Ueda san in the past. So they may have a unified group going in, they just have to decide what they're unified to do. Let's see if this gets confirmed first. Before March 10th as well, Mike, yeah. because March 10th is well, the last they, corona the, BOJ the, meeting. The word is, uh, at least it was yesterday, that uh, the uh, Prime Minister is going to submit the names next Tuesday, CPI day, because we don't have enough to do that day. Uh, and so, and we'll, assuming we'll he, look for he actually accept, accepts this job, unlike yeah. the, the other individual. Mike McKee, thank you. Getting us up to speed on the BOJ. Important meeting March 10th. Let's see if we get that change from the BOJ on yield curve control to Mike's point. Equities right now, where are we? 23 minutes into the session, we are negative two tenths. On the Nasdaq, we're down about six tenths of 1%. Your trading diary, up next.
just 26 minutes into the session, no real drama. On the headline index, the S&P down about two tenths of one percent. On the Nasdaq, down six tenths of one percent. Heading towards still though a weaker losses. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. Coming up, you Mitch Consumer Sentiment Survey. Top of the hour. President Biden speaks with Brazil's Lula at 3:30 Eastern. Then have a meeting later. Plus, we'll hear from the Feds, Waller and Harker throughout the afternoon. Looking ahead to next week, the only thing that matters: Tuesday morning, CPI on deck in the United States, and no doubt more Fed speak, including from Logan and Williams from New York City. That does it for me. Enjoy the long week end of the Super Bowl here stateside. Good luck for the rest of the training day. This was the countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.